So in this clip, I will explain how to derive the stationarity condition for an autoregressive process. We'll start with this ARP process here, which just copied from the lecture. And the question is now, what conditions are required or what restrictions are required? Or which restrictions on the parameters? on the parameters, and these are alpha 5 1 to 5 p are required for the process for y t to be stationary. Okay, so this is this is the question. We're going to answer this in the reverse way. For starters, we will assume stationarity and then we will see so we will assume stationarity that's very important okay now one aspect of stationarity we discussed this in a lecture is that the unconditional mean for the process is constant through time now the, the notation for unconditional mean was just the expectation for y t and we said that should be, we gave that a name, we, gave, uh, we called that mu. And if we have a stationary process, then that implies that this mu is the unconditional mean for t at whatever time index. Okay, so uh, for y t minus 1 as well, for my t, my t minus 2, in fact, for all yt's, okay, so even yt 100 periods ago. They should all have the same unconditional mean at mu. So this is the idea we're going to we're gonna use now. So what we will do is we will we'll call this, we'll put this name in the lecture, no, so we'll call, we'll call it equation 1 here. So we'll take the unconditional expectation, unconditional expectation of equation one. So that means we'll do that very straightforward. That is the expected value of y t is equal to the expected value. Now we just put the right hand side into here. So that's plus 5 on y t minus 1, 5 2, y t minus 2, all the way back to pi p, y t minus p, plus the arrow term epsilon t, and now we close the expectation. So we Working with expectations, we know we can take the expectations of the sum, and so we'll get the expected value. Let's start with the expected value of alpha, so I'll just do that quite mechanically first. The expected value of phi 1 y t minus 1. Now at this stage, let me just pause here and there will be more terms. This one here, the 5 one, this is a parameter. It's unknown, of course, and often we want to estimate it, but it's a parameter and it's a constant. It's not a random variable. That means we can take it outside of the expectation. So for that reason, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'll write 5 one times the expected value of y t minus 1. Of course, the same is valid for the next few terms. Pi 2 times the expected value of t minus 2 plus all sorts of stuff. Phi p expected value by t minus p plus the expected value of epsilon t. Now, two things to note here. This guy is equal to zero as epsilon t is assumed to be white noise. 
to be light noise. Okay, so therefore that is zero and it will fall away. Secondly, um, firstly on the left hand side, just copy this. Now, now we're going to use this bit of information here. Okay, so in particular, we realize that we have several mu's here. That guy is mu, that guy is mu, that guy is mu, and this is mu. So we're going to have mu, 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 and mu here, and I just fill in the rest. Also, um, alpha is an unknown but constant, so the expectation would fall away here. I should have done that in the previous step. Phi 1 plus phi 2 terms in between and p. So we have this. Now, of course, uh, what we can do is we can solve this for mu. Okay, so that's what, what we're going to do now. And what we'll get is mu is equal to, and now this is of course just a bit of algebra, we'll bring all the terms with mu on the other side, and we'll get, I won't write that down, 1 minus phi 1 minus phi 2 my, all the way up to minus phi p times mu, but then we will divide with that term 1 minus phi 1 minus phi 2 and what we end up with is this. One minus phi one minus phi two minus phi p. Okay, so that's just a bit of algebra. More generically, we can write, we can see that what we really have, you could you could rewrite this guy here as one minus phi one plus phi two plus all the way to phi p. So therefore, this is the same as alpha divided by 1 minus the sum of all phi i's, where i goes from 1 to p. So however values, however many lags we have here, p lags, we'll have to sum up all the coefficients. So from here, so this is all derived, importantly, under the assumption of stationarity. So we assumed, remember up here, we assumed stationarity. That was very important. But now making this assumption, we can see what is required for this to be for this to be available. Okay, in particular, what we need is that this term here has to be unequal to one. Because if it was 1, then we would have 1 minus 1 divided by 0. We can't do that. So the condition from here is that the sum of all phi i's, i equals 1 to p, is unequal to 1. Okay. So this is the first part. So as it turns out, this is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Okay, but not sufficient. There's more conditions we need on the coefficients. And we will establish these by looking at the variance. Now we know if a process is stationary, so if yt is stationary, is stationary then the unconditional variance, so variance of yt, should be constant through time as well. Okay, same sort of argument as we did before with the unconditional expectation and so forth. So from this condition, we're going to derive the further requirements on the parameters. We will continue, however, with the special case, we will continue with the special case 
of an A Avon process. And that's just to make our lives easier and the more complicated one would not give us any additional insight. So our A Avon process is yt equals alpha plus phi 1 yt minus 1 plus epsilon t. Okay, the argument is not restricted to the AI1 case, it just makes our life easier. Now, it's going to be one exercise question uh, which, can, which establishes that yt, that this process, can be transformed to what we call a zero mean process. Okay, yt minus the unconditional mean plus phi 1 y t minus 1 minus the unconditional mean plus epsilon t. Now, this is an exercise question. Okay, so in the exercise you will solve this. For the time being, you can just accept this. Okay, of course, you can try and, uh, and do it yourself. So now, we will make the same type of argument as for the unconditional expectation. We'll say if Station if sorry, so we already said sorry, set it up here. If y t is stationary, then this is valid. So we're going to make an argument with this, therefore, we're going to take the variance, let's call this two, and take the variance, the unconditional variance of the equation two. So we'll just put the first step is just extremely mechanical, okay? Just variance operator. Oh, I had a there's no need for a plus here. So the unconditional variance expectator around both sides. Right here, minus one minus mu plus epsilon t. Now, of course, you know that the variance of a sum is not necessarily the sum of the variances. However, now as and we have to argue with this concept with uh, the properties of epsilon t, as epsilon t is white noise, it is independent of y t minus one. Okay, so that means that this guy and this guy over here, here on this term, the only random variable we have here is this. Everything else is constants, although unknown, and as epsilon t and yt minus 1 are independent of each other, and only because of this, we can actually write that this is the same as the variance of phi 1 yt minus 1 minus mu plus the variance of epsilon t. So, a couple of things we can do uh, we can do from here. Firstly, this is a constant uh, with which the random variable here yt minus one is multiplied, so we can bring that outside of the operator. But as it's a variance operator, we need to square it. So we have yt minus one minus mu and plus and here now what we have is the variance of the error term. That's not going to disappear. We'll just give that a name. I think we labeled that before anyway as sigma squared epsilon to signal it's the variance for the epsilon. On the left-hand side, we have the variance of t minus mu. So what have we got here on the left-hand side? This guy and this guy variances of yt minus 1 and yt minus a constant. Now the constant will not contribute to the variance, so we can just basically get rid of the constant. So variance of yt is equal to sigma 1 squared variance of yt minus 1 plus sigma epsilon squared. So we're almost there. Now, of course, we said earlier, if yt is stationary, 
then we said the variance of yt is equal to the variance of yt minus 1. We shall therefore just restate this equation with y, variance yt minus 1 replaced with variance yt. We could also uh, replace this one with variance yt minus 1. So we have variance of yt equals phi 1 squared variance of yt, as this is the same as the variance of yt minus 1, plus sigma squared epsilon. Now we will solve for the variance of yt. And what we get is the following. We get the variance of yt is equal to sigma squared epsilon divided by 1 minus phi 1 squared. So, and now the second condition, let me do that in red again. Okay, what can we see? What restriction is required? So, what parameter restriction does this imply? That is the question. Okay, so now this is a variance. Of course, we want this variance to be larger than zero. Now, for this to be the case, the variance of epsilon squared, as it is a variance, it is larger than zero. So, let's say green, this guy is larger than zero. That means we want this guy to be larger than zero. So, we want 1 minus phi 1 squared to be larger than zero larger than zero. And this, of course, implies that, we'll just bring phi 1 squared on the other side, phi 1 squared is actually smaller than 1. So this is now the second condition. The squared of phi 1, 2 has to be smaller than 1, and therefore the absolute value of phi 1 has to be smaller than 1, okay? Because otherwise, for instance, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 squared is going to be smaller than 1, but 1.5 squared is going to be larger than 1. So that was for the special case of an AR1 process. What about the ARP process? So for the ARP process, for ARP, Without deriving this, the implication for the ARP process is that we need the absolute value of the sum of these coefficients to be smaller than 1. Now you can see that the, this condition here actually encompasses this condition here, because we wanted the sum of the coefficients to be smaller than, uh, uh, sorry, unequal to 1. That's what we derived from the expected value consideration. And that condition is encompassed in here. Because if that was equal to 1, if the sum was equal to 1, then this condition would not be met either. So that was the derivation of the stationarity condition. As I said, this second part, you just accept it uh, from me. You could derive it for the first, for the AR1 process. Uh, you can try it for the ARP, I don't expect you to.